Hi there, welcome to 19th Century Art. In this lecture, we're going to examine neoclassical art in France. Neoclassical art was often referred to as the true style. It was heavily supported by the royal courts, and it was the royal courts that really pushed the neoclassical style into the public view. Part of the power of the courts was that they were, of course, the prime patrons of art. They had tremendous amounts of wealth, and they could do as they wished with it. This absolutism was put into practice with Louis XIV in France. He had coalesced his power. He had brought his nobles more securely under his reign. He lived a long time, and he moved out of the city of Paris, and he built himself this enormous palace in Versailles, where he could rule and control all the nobles in his sight. Two generations on, as we are approaching the 19th century, his grandson, Louis the Sixteenth is not so sharp. He doesn't seem to have the knack for politics. He seems very shy, disengaged. He doesn't quite know how to do his job, and he's not terribly decisive. All the things that Louis the Fourteenth was not. He is living in this incredible palace, and in Versailles, you can see in the Hall of Mirrors the people gathered. It was all about see seeing who was there and how they are meeting and discussing with other people. This was a very highly stratified society, and everyone was sort of jockeying their way up and down this very clear ladder. A very curious fashion emerged toward the beginning of the 19th century, and this was the practice of eye miniatures. This is a very curious little artifact that would have been commissioned, and it would be a portrait that someone would give to their lover. Now, this fashion began when the King of England was madly in love with a woman who was way below his station. He tried desperately to woo her, and he gave her this eye portrait as a way of showing his commitment to her. This eye portrait is a wonderful object because it shows that someone of great status has their eye on you. It is a, indeed, is a way that they show that they have this secret, possibly illicit affair going on. And this interaction was what fueled all the speculation and gossip of this day. As you can see, they are just a tremendous number and variety of these eye portraits. I find them truly fascinating. Each one contains a secret of something they want people to know about, but only so much. In this time, coupled with Louis the Sixteenth, was his wife and Queen Marie Antoinette. She was a very capable woman who uh, had the unfortunate position of being branded a foreigner in France. She was not terribly sympathetic. She was obsessed with fashions and hairstyles, and she's been given a lot of bad press in the notion that she once said when someone told her that the peasants were starving, she flippantly replied, well, let them eat cake. She probably never said such a thing. She was actually fairly concerned about the plight of the poor, but a woman in her position, even a position of great power, really had very little access to affect much change to the way the kingdom was run. This is an absolutely stunning portrait by her personal artist, Elizabeth Vignet Lebrun. You see her, the artist, in her own self-portrait, was an extraordinarily gifted artist of this time, and she had a great talent that 
Marie Antoinette recognized and patronized and brought into the public eye. She insisted that she be allowed to join the Academy of Art, where she was able to present her work. The first and only women who were allowed to paint at that time uh, in the Royal Academy. Elizabeth Vignet Lebrun was a great talent, and she's been largely overlooked, even though she was highly regarded during her day. You see here two portraits, her own daughter here on the left. She began painting portraits under the tutelage of her father, and at age 15, she was earning enough money from her own portrait painting to support herself, her widowed mother, and her younger brother. She escaped from the French Revolution and she moved around the rest of Europe and was enormously prolific as an artist all across Europe. Now in this lecture, I want to focus specifically on this very curious and peculiar object, which to me is such a typical object of the neoclassical style. Now this is a bauble, it's a not a major work of art by any means, but it speaks to a lot of the concerns and obsessions that the nobility had about neoclassical art. So this was an object that Marie Antoinette had commissioned from the porcelain factory at Sevres in 1788. It is the bolsane or breast cup, and it was used especially for milk drinking when she was about in her play farm on the grounds of Versailles. Now this farm was rustic fantasy land where she and her ladies could go and play at being milkmaids. And of course, uh, the exterior is all very rustic. It's made to look like a French provincial farmhouse. But of course, inside it has marble floors and chandeliers. And we wouldn't expect the Queen of France to use a plain old milk bucket like this. Why, she had her very own porcelain milk bucket for just such an occasion. And this sort of playing at being in this rustic way uh, was part of this whole fantasy that was going on at court. And the way in which they embodied this was a part of this sort of escape from the very rigid society that surrounded Versailles. And we can see this also in the very famous painting by Jean Henri Fragonard in this Rococo style with fluffy broccoli like trees. There is this uh, woman on a swing, and in her exuberance, her shoe is flying off. And there's a sort of man behind her who's got these ropes, and he's sort of pulling her back and forth. And then there's this other man, her suitor, who is lying below her in the bushes to catch a glimpse of whatever might reveal itself as she swings past. And so this is a part of this pastoral fantasy that the nobility carried about them. You see that in the hat she's wearing, which is a bergeret, which is a shepherdess hat. Now this fantasy farm that she had built and commissioned was a whole little complex, and in part was her attempt to show how people could improve their lives if they were as wealthy as her. You know, you can imagine this kind of thing is sort of promoting general good health. And the bold saying cup was, of course, a very important idea that we wanted to have mother's milk as well as fresh farm milk available to children. This farmland was really an architectural folly designed and built by Richard Meek in 1786. You can see here in the grand plan how it's really quite on the periphery of the court of Versailles. And it was there that she and her ladies-in-waiting could escape all the pressures of being at court. Now, court life 
was very rigid and structured, and the way in which they wanted to project their power into the world was through adopting this neoclassical style, because the neoclassical style spoke to their empire as something eternal, that they had adopted these forms, that they embraced these classical forms, showed not just their sophistication and their knowledge, but their empire. The French, the German, the Italian, the British, their empires all embraced this idea of a classical past that they reached back toward. So one of the other things that greatly fueled this fascination with the antique past was not only the a very impressive work that came from the Renaissance and the Baroque period, all of which was based on it, but new discoveries in Rome of the ruins of Pompeii, which had been doomed from a volcanic explosion in AD 79 from Mount Vesuvius, and the entire city was covered in 80 feet of ash. Beneath that ash was an incredibly preserved, beautifully evocative, rich picture of what was going on in Roman life at its peak. It's like a frozen time capsule was discovered. What we see then in this and in and a slightly later discovery at Herculaneum uh, in 1752, we can see how elements from this breast cup were taken directly from the classical designs of the past. You can see that well, here's an egg and dart design that adorns the base of the capital and these sort of curls and filigrees. All of that is based on the kind of classical ornamentation. And the goat there is also a symbol of fertility and a symbol of abundance. Now, in Herculaneum, there was a really important kind of discovery after discovery, and they were digging. Now, this wasn't an archaeological dig. This is a treasure hunt. They were just looking for things that they can use and put on display to demonstrate their understanding and value of classical past. So Charles III of Spain and the whole court came together and they looked on as the statue was unearthed of the god Pan. And as they cleaned it off, they suddenly to their horror realized it was a statue of bestiality and they were mortified. And so very quickly, the whole excavation was canceled and they packed this up and shipped it off. And they hid a lot of the things that were discovered in Herculaneum and in Pompeii, these sexual objects that were very common in Rome were just not a part of this new neoclassical world. And I point this out to show that the neoclassical is not just classical. It really is editing out of a lot of material that was very commonplace in the classical times. Now, the other part of this object that we need to examine is the fact that it's porcelain. And porcelain was a highly coveted material that had for centuries eluded European scientists. Now, it had been China for about 1,500 years. They've been developing their very fine porcelain technique. And they were the only ones in the world who were trading this exquisite uh, material. Europe was first introduced to porcelain about 400 years before this bowl, but it had not been able to figure out how it was made until about 1710. And at that point, it started to come into vogue. But before then, a number of sort of porcelain-like things had been developed. The Delta style created a, 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 a white-bodied clay, but it wasn't as hard as the true porcelain. And it, this was a palace in Versailles that was quickly built in 1680 to kind of celebrate their fascination with porcelain, this porcelain house 
was eventually demolished because it was just so poorly built and it didn't last a decade. So the discovery of porcelain was a very important part of this enlightenment science. And it was these new chemists and formerly alchemists who worked on this extraordinary problem, knowing that there was enormous amounts of wealth to be made. So Ehrenfeld, Walter von Tirschenhaus, he's the German who gets the credit, but it was really Johann Friedrich Bottinger who did much of the legwork to figure out the basic components. Here we see Bottinger's notes on porcelain from 1708, just a few years before it went into production. So the breast cup we are looking at is from the French Sevres porcelain factory, and they were commissioned directly by the Emperor Louis the Sixteenth to produce all of the wares at Versailles. The factory, which had been founded in 1740, moved to the larger quarters in 1756 and became a preeminent porcelain manufacturer in Europe in the second half of the 18th century.